Welcome again to Statics, another example here at Lawrence Tech. I'm Professor Jim Kearns, and today we're going to talk about a simple truss shown here at the right that includes some zero force members, and we'll use the method of joints to find all of the forces in the members around joint C there. And we'll give you another example where I'm going to apply loading at all of these points here, and we'll look again to see how that changes our assumptions about zero force members and how it changes our analysis. So we'll get two problems at once. Here's our problem statement. Uh, given this truss in this 100 Newton load on the truss itself, we need to find the forces in elements BC, which is this one, CF, which is this one, CD, this one, and CG, that one. So this is uh, a subtle way that I might, or some other professor might, lead you to use the method of joints, because all of the elements I want you to find the forces in are clustered around one single joint. And that joint just so happens, to make the problem simple, to be close to one of our points on the truss where there's an external force applied. Okay. The method we could have used is a method of sec uh, sections. If, if I had, for example, asked you to find the forces in this member, this member, and this member, that would have been another subtle hint that you can cut through all of those with a single, um, single section and use the method of sections, but that's another video. Our first step is going to find the reaction forces at each end. And actually, all I really need to solve this problem is, is the reaction force here at B. Um, I can do the sum of the moments about A. And then I have my 100 Newtons times, um, times 6 meters. This whole truss is set up on 3 meter squares. And minus the unknown force here at B, which is at a distance of 12 meters, and, and do the math. Or I can just kind of look at this one. In this case, it's, it's very symmetric. Um, the load is right in the middle. And I can just assume by symmetry that I have a 50 Newton load right here. Now, the next thing that comes up is are there any zero force members? Um, I've seen students miss this on an exam, and once you miss the existence of zero force members, everything you do from that point out is wrong. It just, you can't make it work. Let's take a look at element CF here, and I'm going to draw free body diagrams of the joint at C. If this is my joint, I have the potential for a force that direction, a force this direction and a force that direction. Because remember, one of our assumptions in a truss is that all of these joints are pins and all of the members are two force members, so they only exert forces lined up with those pins, okay? And even if, if this member, for example, if this member were bent like that for some reason, the only possible directions for the forces would be from pin to pin. So that's, that's our uh, member C, our joint C, I should say. The member CF is, again, a two-force member, so potentially there's a force there and a force there. And our pin here at F, we have the potential for force there, that direction, and that direction. And they could be inwards or outwards. If I look at F, um, and I try to do the sum of forces in the y direction, I have potential for a force from element CF, but that's it. The sum of the forces in the y direction at point F equals zero, so I have equals CF and nothing else. So what does that tell me? That tells me that CF just has to be zero. And any time you see a member ending in a straight line T like this, there's it's a zero force member. Just just looking at it, you should see that because there's no no possibility. Well, I should say, when it ends in a straight T like that, and there's no reaction force or applied force there, um, 
this this force here has to be zero for that joint to be in equilibrium. So if 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 this force here equals zero, then that force equals zero, and that force equals zero, and you know this force here equals zero. So CF becomes a zero force member, and I'm just going to remove it from my diagram. Okay. Now I did want to find the force in CF as part of my solution. Well, there's there's that answer right there. It's equal zero. And obviously, we can see from the same thing that EH is zero. Uh, DG, well, I've, I've got a force reacting here at, at G. But if we look at the other end here, again, we have potentially a force downward. But there's no force to go up or down to for that to react against. So the force in DG also has to be zero. And that's a zero force member. I can take those out of my truss for my analysis and it now becomes possible to actually solve for the forces. Uh, otherwise, we're just out of luck. So there's what my truss looks like when I remove these zero force members. Okay. Looking at the dimensions of this truss, um, you know, basically this was three meters. This is three meters. Uh, this angle here works out to be 45 degrees from the from the base. Okay, so let's start by looking at finding the force here in CB. And since I have this upward force here, chances are that this CB is going to be in compression. And I could just assume that it's in tension and do the math, and then I'd get a negative number, and then I'd realize that my assumption of tension was wrong. But I'm going to just look at it and make the call that, isn't, that it is compression. So I'm going to take the, to find that value, I'm going to do the sum of the forces in the y direction at point B, and that's equal to zero for static equilibrium. So I have the 50 newtons up from, from the um, reaction force. And if I assume that I'm in compression, uh, the, the y component of that force is going to be downward. So it's minus CB times the sine of 45. And this is assuming compression. OK. And that gives me C. B equals 50 over the sine of 45, and that gives me 70.7 .7 newtons in compression. We already determined this one was zero, and we just erased it from our truss. We have two left to go. Looking at point C, I, I can see if I try to do some of the forces in the x direction, I have two unknowns. But if I try to do the sum of the forces in the y direction, the only unknown is the force in this element. If I do the sum of the forces in the y direction at C, I've got the uh, y component of, of that force, and that's equal to the 70.7 .7 times the sine of 45, which comes out to be 50 newtons. And if I assume that it's compression again, that'll be plus the force CG, this one, and uh, that would be times the sine of 40, 45 again, and that's equal to zero. I forgot to write the equal zero. Um, so if I solve for CG, I get a minus 50 over the sine of 45, and that gives me a negative 70.7 .7 newtons. And since it's negative, um, obviously my assumption about compression was wrong, so the actual force is 70.7 .7 newtons in tension. So those, there's the reactions from three of the elements already figured out. The only one left is CD. And I can find that from the sum of the forces in the x direction at C. And that's going to be equal to the force from element CB, which is my 70.7 .7 newtons in compression times the sine of 45. That's going to be pointing to the left. So I've that 
So that comes to a minus 50 newtons. I've got 70.7 .7 newtons in tension from element CG. And that again is going to be pointing to the left. So 70.7 .7 times the cosine, I said sine before, cosine it should have been the way I've got it drawn. But 70.7 .7 times the cosine of 45 is again equal to minus 50. And then um, I'm going to assume that uh, CD is pushing to the right. So that will be put it in compression. So it'll be plus CD, where again, we're assuming, I'll make that an uppercase to be consistent. We're assuming compression. And that gives me CD equals 100 newtons in compression. And that is all my forces. Now let's look at a variation of this um, where I've applied loads in here, here, and here in three places, okay? This changes the problem somewhat. First of all, it's obviously the loads here are 150 newtons on each side. And again, I'm going to find all of the forces at joint C. But it changes our determination of zero force members. Now, if I draw that free body diagram of around around joint C and, and at element CH, at C, I've got a force that way, force that way, force that way, and potentially a force this way. I've got my CH, which can have a force like this. And at H itself, I've got a force that way, i got a force that way, I could have a force this way if there's a force in CH, and I've got a force that I've applied at this joint of 100 newtons. And recall that one of our assumptions when we're doing these truss analysis is, is that we do apply the forces at the joints. So now for pin H to be in equilibrium, oh, I've got 100 newtons down, so I have to have 100 newtons up, so that makes CH equal to 100 newtons, and that will be in tension. And obviously, I have 100 newtons downward at that point there, okay? So I'll label that 100 newtons in tension. So that is no longer a zero force member, okay? And similarly, EF would no longer be a zero force member, but nothing as, you know, even though we, have, we do have a load at one end of D, Right here, if we look at the other end of D, again, it just ends in a straight T or a straight corner with no forces applied in with a Y component at all. So the forces at, so for D to be in equilibrium, the Y forces have to be equal to zero. So DG is still a zero force member. And we could remove that. Um, not that's going to affect our analysis using the method of uh, joints at point C, but just it can still be removed, okay? So having having determined that, I should write this up here, C H equals 100 newtons in tension. Having determined that, we can look at CB. Um, CB, we can look at the sum of the forces at B in the Y direction equals my 1... 50 newtons that are applied as a reaction force. Uh, and I'll assume compression here. So minus uh, CB times the sine of 45 again. And that gives me CB, assuming compression, equals 212 newtons in compression. Again, uh, going back to joint C, I still don't have enough to do the sum of the forces in the X direction, but I can do sum of forces in the Y direction. That's going to be equal to the force from CB, which is upward. So I've got 2, 1, 2 times a sine of 45. And I've got my force in CH, and it's downwards, and it's minus 100 newtons for that, equals 
or excuse me, and if I assume compression again, I'll go plus um, CG, the Y component of CG, CGY. And if I solve that, I get CGY equals minus 112 newtons. So given that our assumption about compression was incorrect and the magnitude of the Y component of the force is 112 newtons, we can determine that CG, the total force, is equal to the 112 over the sine or cosine. Now this is y direction we're sine. Sine of 45, and that's equal to 158 newtons in tension. In our last step, we'll look at the sum of the forces in the x direction at C. And um, that will give us our last unknown here, and that's equal to my 212 times the uh, cosine of 45 is the force from this element, um, and that is negative because it's going to be pushing, uh, pointing to the left because that element is in compression. Um, this element right here is in tension, and so that's also going to be to the left. So that's minus 158 cosine of 45. And I can assume compression, because that just seems to make sense at this point. That um, So that will be a plus CD, and there's no angles because it's just directly at, uh, it's just a direct horizontal force. And if I work that out, I get CD equals 54 newtons in compression. And that is everything that I needed to find in this problem. And obviously, um, you know, if we just look at it, we could figure out what this is. And that would be the same as that. Um, these two could be different because but because the truss is symmetric we can assume you know that it's going to be the same uh, this is going to be 54 and actually yeah once we solved for the force in hb we'd have the entire truss solved if that's what our problem was but i don't want to waste your time you know we've come to our solved our objectives we used the method of joints and found a couple different examples and i hope you can recognize the zero force members uh, quickly and easily because that's going to be the key to getting to getting a good grade on an exam is you know finding that zero force member to make it solvable that's it thanks for watching and i'll see you on the flip side